It's been the honor of my life to be your president. So many of you have written the past few weeks to say thanks, but I could say as much to you. Nancy and I are grateful for the opportunity you gave us to serve. Those are the words of former America president and conservative icon Ronald Reagan. A lot has been said about Reagan, some of it good, some of it bad, but there's no denying his presence in today's political landscape. Having won in 1980 with 489 electoral votes and then again in 1984 with 525 electoral votes, I think it is fair to say Ronald Reagan was wildly popular. Even though President Reagan had some detractors and had some bad moments during his presidency, he was still one of America's best and most popular for many reasons, but particularly because his economic plan stabilized a very volatile U.S. economy. He helped defeat what was the greatest enemy since Nazi Germany at the time, the Soviet Union, and because he communicated so very effectively with everyday Americans. What constitutes a good economy? There are many things that economists look at. The GDP, inflation, the unemployment rate, and then some. All are very important analyses that we have to look at. Many people will argue that we experienced a slight recession at the onset of Ronald Reagan's presidency. Quote, prior to the current recession, meaning the 2008 recession, the deepest post-World War II economic downturn occurred in the early 1980s. According to the accepted arbiter of the economy's ups and downs, the National Bureau for Economic Research, a brief recession in 1980 lasting only six months and a short period of growth were followed by a sustained recession from July 1981 to November 1982. The unemployment rate hovered between 7% and 8% from the summer of 1980 to the fall of 1981 when it began to rise quickly. By March 1982, it had reached 9%, and in early December of that year, the unemployment rate stood at its recession peak of 10.8%. The jobless rate slowly receded over the next few years, falling to 8.3% by the end of 1983 and to 7.2% by the 19. 1984 presidential election. The unemployment rate did not fall below 6%, however, until September 1987. Unquote. Year 2010. The job market was struggling at the time. This is a completely fair assessment of the situation. Reagan did not immediately fix the economy. However, I do think it is imperative to look at Congress as well. In America, we have a system of checks and balances. So the president is never the be-all, end-all policymaking. It takes everybody. According to House.gov, the Democrats thoroughly controlled the House of Representatives during Reagan's presidency. The Republicans never held more than 192 seats in the House of Representatives. It takes, as we know, 218 seats to have full control. Republicans were not close. At the same time in the Senate, according to Senate.gov, Republicans did hold the Senate in the 97th Congress with 53 of the 100 seats. Republicans would also hold the Senate until 1987 and there before when Reagan took office. So with a split Congress, not much was going to get done. The argument can be made that when Democrats held the House and the Senate in 1987, the job market improved. That's not a completely basis claim, although I think that getting the economy or the job market more specifically stabilized in less than a year is a bit of a stretch. Usually the first year of a new Congress, credit or criticism is given to the previous congressional session. Whether this is a fair assessment or not, this is the way both sides have played the game politically. The argument of high unemployment rate does hold merit. However, there is more to the economy than just that. Another incredibly important asset of the economy is inflation. So what precisely do I mean by inf inflation? Well, according to the Federal Reserve, quote, 
Inflation is the increase in the prices of goods and services over time. Inflation cannot be measured by an increase in the cost of one product or service or even several products or services. Rather, inflation is a general increase in the overall price level of the goods and services in the economy. Unquote. Federal Reserve, of 2016. I think Reagan's work as president was one of his best. Now, take a look at figure one in this, uh, in this uh, slide I have here. Um, I obtained it from macrotrends.com, and it shows that from 1981 to 1983, uh, inflation was way down. So, like I said before, 1981 was Reagan's first full year in office, so we don't want to completely give him credit to make it fair, because that was his first year. So let's look at 1982. In 1982, you could see that inflation was down even further than it was in 1981. So we have to argue that Reagan's policies were having an effect here. We did see a bit of a boost back up to 1981 levels in 1983, but it was still down. And it went right back down thereafter. Um... And again, in 1984, we did see it go back into the positive, into the green. But again, thereafter, it went down. So, I do hear the argument that uh, Reagan wasn't very good with helping the poor. So, here's a quote. Quote, the individual tax brackets were indexed for inflation. And most of the poor were exempted from the individual income tax. Unquote. Niskanen, 2021. So according to Niskanen, the poor did get some of their money back as they were exempted from the individual income tax. Most economists will agree that giving poor individuals um, a little bit of a stimulus actually creates a stronger economy. The theory is that the wealthier will tend to invest and save while the poor will tend to spend their money, which creates a more thriving economy and stimulates the economy. By reducing, tax, reducing taxes and government intervention, by the way, Reagan effectively stabilized a very volatile inflationary economic period. The final big piece of the economy is the GDP. Just as with inflation, let's clear up what exactly GDP is. According to Tim Stobrieski with Harvard Business School, quote, GDP stands for Gross Domestic Product which represents the total monetary value or market value of finished goods and services produced within a country during a period, typically one year or one quarter. In this sense, it's a measurement of domestic production and can be used to measure a country's economic health. Unquote. Stobrieski, 2021. Now let's take a look at figure two. I obtained this from Macro Trends again. And... Um, Let's discuss what exactly is going on here. So, as is clear in figure two, the GDP was consistently up during Reagan's administration other than 1982. So in 1982, it was down a little bit. That means, according to Stobrieski, that Reagan's economy was very healthy as the GDP is a measure for a healthy economy. Um, as I was mentioning before, a lot of people will say that income inequality started during the Reagan presidency, but the fact that the GDP was up, inflation was down, and people were receiving tax cuts in each bracket shows that not only was the economy very healthy, but there was balance. So to summarize, there was a bit more unemployment than I expected in Reagan's administration, but for the people who did work, everything seemed to be going rather well. The facts are clear that Ronald Reagan stabilized an economy that was very up and down during the 1970s. America's biggest enemy after World War II was the Soviet Union. Immediately following winning a massive war, the Americans and Russians embarked on years of a Cold War. Although never directly firing shots at one another, they held massive disdain for each other. Enter Ronald Reagan. Reagan did take a hard stance against communism from the very beginning. Quote, in his first presidential press conference, Reagan stunned official Washington by denouncing the Soviet leadership as still dedicated to world revolution and a one world socialist communist state. As he wrote in his official autobiography, 
I decided we had to send as powerful a message as we could to the Russians that we weren't going to stand by anymore while they armed and financed terrorists and subverted democratic governments, unquote, Lee 2019. Reagan wanted to kill communism. He spent billions to ensure we were ready for a war. Quote, the Reagan Doctrine, a name coined by syndicated columnist Charles Krauthammer, was the most cost-effective of all the war, Cold War doctrines, costing the U.S. less than a billion dollars a year while forcing the cash-strapped Soviets to spend some $8 billion annually to deflect its impact, unquote Lee 2019. As is clear, Reagan spent a lot of time and energy to ensure communism died, which it did, but many will argue that Reagan's efforts did not have as much of an impact on whether the Soviet Union itself died. Quote, With access to thousands of pages of Soviet records, oral histories, and memoirs, we now know that the confrontational approach that defined Reagan's first few years in office had very little, if any, impact on Soviet strategic decision-making. In fact, the antagonism of Reagan's early presidency likely prolonged the Cold War by elevating hardline anti-American voices over those of moderate reformers like Gorbachev. Von Rennenkampf, 2020. I think this is a solid argument against Reagan's efforts. He was very bombastic against communism and the Soviet Union itself. But there could have been a little bit of disdain by Russians against him for that very reason. I can remember watching a video of a joke that Reagan once told about an American and a Russian arguing. Um, and I think it's very important that you hear it from Ronald Reagan himself. The story was an American and a Russian arguing about their two countries. And the American said, look, in my country, I can walk into the Oval Office. I can pound the president's desk and say, Mr. President, I don't like the way you're running our country. And the Russian said, I can do that. The American said, you can? He says, yes. I can go into the Kremlin, to the general secretary's office, pound his desk and say, Mr. General Secretary, I don't like the way President Reagan's running his country. <laughs> Now, while for some that may seem like a minor or insignificant quote, I think it shows the sort of uh, mockery, if you will, of the Russians that could have caused a little bit of a um, little bit of a, an upset feeling by the Russians that could have caused the USSR to last longer. However, something that Mr. von Rennenkampf did not mention in his article was that it did end during Reagan's presidency, or shortly thereafter, that being the USSR. There's no denying that. Why couldn't the USSR hang on until well after Reagan left, just to spite him? It isn't like the change immediately signaled a turnaround for Russia. If Reagan's words truly offend, offended Russian dignitaries, I could easily see the communists hang on until someone else took office. It is sort of the way of authoritarian regimes. Act out of spite when they're about to lose power. Now, many conservatives will argue that Reagan himself ended the Cold War, which I think is a little bit unfair, but I do think he did his part to ensure that the Soviet Union fell during his presidency or very shortly thereafter. <laughs> President Reagan was famed for his incredibly witty comebacks and takedowns of the Democrats. It is something that many Republicans love him for. I mentioned the joke above about the Russians, and that, according to Reagan himself, made even the Russian diplomats laugh. A lot of our friends on the left will say, well, this is just a pointless quip by conservatives. They'll say, communication doesn't make a great president. Well, I think that's unfair and stupid. Not only does a president need to be able to communicate with his constituents, but he also needs to be able to communicate with other world leaders that might be hostile towards him. Something I did not mention in the previous section was von, Rennen von Rennenkampf uh, sort of mocking uh, Reagan's butting up to the Russian leaders. Quote, In a remarkable scene that some arch-conservatives seem to have forgotten, Reagan warmly embraced Gorbachev as the two world leaders casually chatted with cheering Soviet citizens while strolling through Moscow Square. Unquote. Von Rennenkampf, 2020. I think the embrace and the cheers of the Soviet citizens showed that Reagan was a sly talker. 
He was able to will Gorbachev and the Russian people to his side. Why is that something to be upset by? It saved the world from potential nuclear war. I credit this to Reagan being quick-witted and smooth enough in his communication to get people, Democrats or Republicans, Americans or Russians, to side with him. The fact that Reagan was considered the great communicate, the great communicator is not just a small personal attraction. I think it's a trait that every president needs to have. I would argue that President Obama had the same vibe for Democrats, although not as smooth of a talker in my opinion. He was smooth talking. He was able to will some Republicans to his side. And I think this is a must for presidents to be able to speak and communicate well. While some will argue that being the great communicator was just a small personal trait, I disagree. Let's take, for instance, the 1984 presidential election. In the first debate, Reagan was off. He was sluggish. Um, he wasn't himself. And a lot of Democrats were on the attack of that, saying that he was too old for his job. Well, you know, I could quote and tell you about what Reagan said, but I think, again... Let's hear it from the man himself. You already are the oldest president in history, and some of your staff say you were tired after your most recent encounter with Mr. Mr. Uh, Mondale. Um, I recall yet that President Kennedy had to go for days on end with very little sleep during the Cuba Missile Crisis. Is there any doubt in your mind that you would be able to function in such circumstances? Not at all. Mr. Truitt and I, and I want you to know that also, I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit, for political purposes, my opponent's youth and inexperience. This jab back at Democrats for hitting Reagan for his age backfired. Reagan's quick-wittedness made even Walter Mondale, his opponent, crack a smile. Reagan was that good. Polls showed his numbers were dropping before this. After this, Reagan went on to win the election by a landslide, losing only one state, which I believe was Mondale's home state. President Reagan's uh, quick-witted, sly, smooth-talking helped him not only win elections, but win over Soviet citizens and other world leaders. He was the great communicator, and that is an incredibly important trait for the leader of the free world to possess. Quote, but as the past 40 years have gone by, it appears more and more that gilded age brutality is the U.S. norm, and the years of an American middle class were a brief exception. Unquote. Schwarz, 2021. A lot of people dislike the idea of the union busting that made Ronald Reagan more famous. John Schwarz, author of the column The Murder of the U.S. Middle Class, began 40 years ago this week, seemingly agrees with the notion that the middle class was hurt by the union busting. Cambridge Dictionary defines union busting as, quote, the activity of reducing or destroying the power of a trade union or trade unions, unquote. CambridgeDictionary.com the biggest piece of union busting was the moment Reagan fired almost 12,000 air traffic controllers and then barred them from working in the federal government again. Quote, President Reagan fired 11,345 striking air traffic controllers and barred them from ever working again for the federal government. By October of that year, the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization, or PATCO, the union that had called the strike, had been decertified and lay in ruins. Unquote. Schwarz 2021. This was the first case of a major union being destroyed by the Reagan administration. A question that comes to my mind is what makes a union so important anyway? Well, according to the AFL-CIO, a major union in America, unions are necessary because they make things better for everyone. Quote, when working people come together, they make things better for everyone. Joining together in unions enables workers to negotiate for higher wages and benefits and improve conditions in the workplace. There are millions of union members in America from all walks of life. These individuals know that by speaking up together, you can accomplish more than you could on your own. Unquote. AFL-CIO 2022. According to all of this, Reagan hurt Americans when he broke up unions. I would question why the GDP was improving more and more during Reagan's presidency. GDP growth, as mentioned earlier, is the typical measuring for the health of the economy. 
It is sort of, sort of like taking your temperature when you fall ill. If there is no fever, doesn't that mean you're okay? All this is typically played out for class warfare. Quote, the significance of Reagan's actions is rarely discussed in today's mainstream and for understandable reasons. It was the first huge offensive in a war that corporate America has been waging on this country's middle class ever since. Unquote. Schwarz 2021. Is it really hard to believe that unions aren't always having the best of the workers at heart? I would like to take you to um, an instance between Chrysler and the UAW. 13 UAW workers were filmed by Fox TV drinking and smoking weed on the job back in 2010. These workers were rightfully fired. But for some reason or another, the UAW fought on their behalf and got them reinstated. And this information was gained from Perry in 2012. So, is this really the work of the unions? Is this what they do? The other workers at that car manufacturer were not safe. These guys were high and or drunk. Working on cars. Probably not safe. Another issue with unions and why Reagan was not completely wrong to fight them is the fact that they cause a massive increase in pricing. Look at all the sports leagues and how much the ticket prices have gone up as athletes have begun to be paid more thanks to the unions. Unions cause it. Is keeping food and prices lower really killing the middle class, as John Schwartz put it? Where Reagan went wrong was not offering federal protection for workers. So, I can only speak for myself and today, but corporate America today is not for middle America either. They are for themselves. What Ronald Reagan, and in my opinion, anybody who wants to get rid of unions, the plague that is called unions, needs to offer is protection for workers. The National Labor Relations Board should act as the arbiter between employer and employee. It's like, why do we need unions if we have the Department of Labor, right? Like, what's the point? Unions only serve to, in my opinion, artificially raid raise the wages of those workers and in all actuality they create more inflation to start in this situation i believe our friends on the left are highly incorrect to call this an error on reagan's part our friends on the left will typically say that reagan massively mishandled the aids epidemic often citing him as the reason the disease spread as quickly and with as many deaths as it did. Well, this assessment is not entirely true. Let's take a look at how long it took the CDC, the art of diseases like this, to actually describe AIDS. Quote, In fall 1982, the CDC described the disease as AIDS for the first time. Unquote. Bennington Castro, 2020. We were well into Reagan's first term when the CDC actually began to look at this as an epidemic. We can clearly see that it wasn't just Reagan that did not take a deep look at AIDS, but also the CDC as well. But I also think it's important to go further than just Reagan and the CDC. Quote, Despite the growing cases and a new name, news outlets struggled with the disease, or at least how to cover it. Some even shied away from giving it too much attention. Though the New York Times initially reported on the mysterious illness in July 1981, it would take almost two years before the prestigious paper gave AIDS front page space on May 25th, 1983. Unquote, Bennington Castro, 2020. It took until 1983 before a new source decided to front page AIDS as a real public health emergency. America as a whole did not see this as a threat. My question was why? Let's take a look at Larry Speaks, Ronald Reagan's press secretary, and see what he was saying about AIDS at the time. Quote, this kind of squeamishness around covering and discussing AIDS was evident during press conferences and among government officials at the time. During a 1982 White House press briefing, conservative journalist Lester King Solving questioned Larry Speaks, President Reagan's press secretary, about the president's reaction to AIDS, which was then affecting some 600 people. When King Solving mentioned the disease was known as the gay plague, the press pool erupted in laughter. Rather than providing a substantive answer, Speaks said, I don't have it sparking more laughter. He then proceeded to question Kent Solving multiple times if he had AIDS. Unquote, Bennington Castro, 2020. This is where I think Reagan and his administration was at its worst. They mocked this disease, laughing at it. While we have the benefit of hindsight here, I think I speak for everyone when I say it should have been taken seriously as soon as it began to clearly spread. It was also known as the gay plague, and while it did spread mostly in the gay community, that should not have mattered. 
people, American citizens, were dying. That should have been enough itself. However, to blame Reagan for the spread of the disease itself is sort of unfair. AIDS is typically spread through sex. A president cannot do much to stop people from doing what they want to do. To blame Reagan for having made the AIDS epidemic worse is an unfair critique in my opinion. It's completely fair to say Reagan and all government officials failed Americans when they mocked AIDS and did not take it seriously. The president open, the president openly mocking any disease can cause a more lax society that thinks, well, I won't get it. And I think Reagan's administration, if not Reagan himself, did a disservice to America by not putting forth more funds and time to stopping the spread of this disease. Of all that Reagan had done, good or bad, I could say this was his worst moment. AIDS was not his fault, nor did he make it worse, but he should have done more and shown more concern. Throughout the research I have done, I think it is clearer now than ever. Ronald Reagan was a great American hero. He did so much to stabilize a country that was rocking in the 1970s. He was not a perfect man. One does not exist. He stabilized our economy. He made sure we saw the end of the USSR. And he communicated so very well with the American people. All this and more truly did make Reagan one of the best American presidents.